You know, I've been going through a, a um, tough time at home. There was, um, I had a, a difficult moment with my daughter few, last week. We were sitting down on the couch. It's kind of a, kind of a parenting scare, I guess. We were sitting down on the couch, and uh, she turns me out of the blue, and she tells me, it was my seven-year-old daughter, she tells me that she wants to be a vegetarian. And now the, and she didn't know the word, actually, at first. She said that she's, she said, Daddy, what's the, the when someone only eats vegetables? And I said, vegetarian? And she said, yeah, I wanna, I'm that. That's what I want to be. And of course, I'm thinking to myself, no daughter of mine, no daughter of mine is going to be a vegetarian. But I, you know, I realized that there were, there were signs leading up to this. Like, for example, uh, earlier last summer, we were out, I was out fishing with her. And she caught, like, I think it was like a bluegill or something. And uh, she pulled the hook out and, I guess, caused some internal bleeding. It happens. Threw the fish back in, catch and release. And the fish bobbed back up to the surface and was just laying there. Right? And then she pointed to the fish and said, Daddy, why is the fish laying there? I said, oh, he's probably, uh, probably sleeping. You know, it took a lot out of him when you caught him. And then it started bleeding. And she said, what, but why, what's the red? St- why is it bleeding? And then I had to admit, well, he's, yeah, you, you might have killed him. It's okay, though. Don't worry. She, and she was devastated by that. Absolutely devastated. I think that was the beginning of her animal rights activism. But anyway, fast forward, she tells me she's a vegetarian. And I'm pretty distraught over that because I can't imagine having a vegetarian in the house. But um, the next day, I'm talking to her again, and she tells me that uh, she decided that she's a vegetarian, but she can still eat chicken nuggets. So she'll make a, an exception for that. Then the day after that, she said that, well, I'm a vegetarian, but I can eat chicken nuggets, but also, of course, like sausage and bacon with breakfast. I can have that. And then each, each successive day, she started adding more meat products onto her vegetarian diet until now she's just back. She's a vegetarian who also eats meat, which is fine, which is perfectly valid. That is a self-identity that I can respect. Uh, and, and, and her trajectory of vegetarianism, I think, follows a similar tra- trajectory of, of a lot of people who, you know, announce themselves to be vegetarian. You know, one of the, one of the, the, the small joys of parenthood is uh, just seeing the kinds of names and labels that your kids come up with for things. Um, as they're as they're sort of like making sense of the world, and that could, that could always be a lot of fun. And so I, I didn't, it, it could be fun, but it's also a little terrifying at times. So I had this experience a couple of days ago. Um, I was at home. We were we were in the living room at night, and my my four year old son, who he's always got a ton of energy. He's like a rabid raccoon running around the house at all at all hours of the day, uh, just f- full full of of energy. But this was it was getting late. It was like eight o'clock. And he, he was, had more energy than usual. And I was trying to figure out what was going on with him. And then he said to me, he said, uh, hey, daddy, guess what? And I said, what? And he said, uh, I, I, found some, I found some wild beans. I ate some wild beans and they've made me strong and crazy. That's what he said. And I thought for a minute, like, wild beans that you ate that have made you crazy. What the hell did this kid find and eat? And I'm racking my brain now because I'm thinking, was he, did he find, was he, did he eat like poison berries from outside? Did he, was he in the medicine cabinet? This is a four-year-old. He ate something that he considers a wild bean. Did he find like a crack rock and eat it? I don't think so. I don't smoke a lot of crack at the house so that he shouldn't have been able to find that. Um, and then my, but my wife quickly put piece it all together and realized that he had somehow invaded our, uh, our, uh, our pantry, and we had a whole bag, I guess, of chocolate-covered raisins, and he had ate the entire bag. I don't know how he got up there, where he found them. I didn't even know we had them. He ate the whole bag, and then he was on a sugar high. So that was the answer. I mean, that could be, with a, with a four-year-old, though, that could be anything. Wild beans. And that's just a great, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a great way of looking at chocolate-covered raisins, I suppose. You know, established titles is your opportunity to earn the title of Lord or Lady and gain the respect that you so richly deserve. All you need is a one square foot plot of land in Scotland. Established titles is a project based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies in English. In your title pack, you'll be bestowed with at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, plus an official certificate, which I have here with a crest. Your certificate features a unique plot number with which you can see the exact location of your land. 
Title packs from established titles are a fun and unique gift for any occasion. There are even couple packs that uh, come with adjoining plots of land for that special someone in your life. With your certificate, you could officially add the prefix of Lord or Lady to your credit cards, your plane tickets, and even your dating profile. Established Titles commits to preserving the woodlands, uh, not only in Scotland, but around the planet. A tree is planted for every order they receive, and uh, you probably know this about me. That was a really important part of this uh, deal for me. Established Titles told me that the, the first 200 people to purchase a title pack using my exclusive link will receive a plot within walking distance of mine. Depending on how many people sign up, we could build our own kingdom even. We're taking over the globe. Established Titles is also running a huge sale right now, and if you use code Walsh at checkout, you'll get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash Walsh to get your gifts now and help support the channel. You know, one of my favorite things uh, about little kids is the way that they question things. Well, that could be my favorite thing and also my least favorite thing. It depends on the questions they're asking and how many times they ask the same question in the context and everything. Um, but the good thing with kids is their, their minds are always working and they're trying to figure stuff out. And um, you, you never know what exactly is going on up there until they open their mouths, as my four-year-old did last night while he was sitting on the couch and... Um, and he, he turned to me and he asked, pointing, pointing to his older brother, he said, Daddy, if me and Luke switched heads, what would happen? And I said, well, I mean, you'd die, first of all. So don't, that's the first thing. And you'd probably make a heck of a mess in the process. So, and he kind of goes silent and he thinks about it. And then I start thinking about it too. And now I'm, now I'm, now my wheels are turning. And then I, I asked him, I said, well, okay. What if you did switch heads with him? W would you now have Luke's body or Luke's head? Like, would, would, would giving your head to Luke mean that you go with your head? Or would it be more accurate to say that you remain with your body and now you just have Luke's head? You see what I'm saying? Very philosophical question. And, um, and he, he processed it for a while. And eventually we both agreed that he would probably travel with his head. But it's an interesting question. And then later on when I was putting him to bed and we're still talking about this, this question of uh, removing heads and everything, great thing to talk about at bedtime and, it, you know, th and things are finally clicking and he goes, wait a second, daddy. So, so I'm in my head, I'm in my bones in my head. And he starts knocking on his head like he's knocking on the front door, trying to communicate with himself. And then we got it. Then we started talking about the mind body problem and neurology and the soul. And it was all very metaphysical after a while. Um, I say we were talking about that, but it was like I was talking and he was just sitting there not understanding anything I was saying. But I did make sure to emphasize, putting all that aside, don't actually try to do this. Please do not try to take your head off. That's all. That should be the main point here. You know, I was sitting down with my kids at uh, dinner last night and uh, I asked them, as I always ask them, you know, what did you learn today in their, in the, their homeschool classes? And in the past, I've asked them, uh, I, I would ask a more a broader question like, uh, what happened today? Or, you know, what did you do today? And I realized with kids, you got to be more specific because if you ask a broad question, I, you know, I would always ask, what, what, what happened today? And uh, the answer would always be something like, uh, well, we went outside and we saw something in the yard and we, we went up to it and it was a squirrel. He was dead and he, and his, his, he didn't have eyes. And I would say, wow, dead squirrel, huh? What else happened? Anything? No, that was it. Just a dead squirrel. What did you do with the dead squirrel? Oh, we played dodgeball with it. Oh, dear God. Get away from you. You all have the black plague now. Um, so I, I get more specific. And now I ask, what did you learn today? And that, and that can be a fruitful thing. So I asked that yesterday. And um, my kids told me that they were learning about, uh, one, of the, one of the things they learned about was uh, persuasion. And uh, what, what is persuasion and how do you persuade people, you know, especially in the form of writing? And they were telling me about that. And I said, well, that's great. So uh, let's try this out. Can you uh, persuade me of something? Just try to persuade me uh, of, of something. And uh, they couldn't figure out what they should persuade me of. And then, of course, my wife was, was there and she chimed in immediately and said, oh, kids, you should persuade daddy to get a dog because we're still doing the dog thing. And uh, my daughter made an attempt, and her attempt at persuasion was this. Daddy, I am persuading you. You are being persuaded. Get a dog. Get a dog. You're persuaded. And I tried to explain to her that's not persuasion. You can't just make your demand louder and louder. 
that what you're doing here, this is like an exorcism. The power of Christ compels you. That's not persuasion. But then I also realized that um, that is basically how arguments go on Twitter. This is she's 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 ready for her own Twitter account, I think, because that's that's the way persuasion works. Not just on Twitter, but in society generally.